In October of 1347, 12 ships dropped anchor at a Sicilian port. Those who eagerly approached were met with a grisly sight. Almost all aboard were either dead or barely alive, their skin erupting with blackened boils that dripped pus and blood. In horror, the Sicilian authorities demanded that the ships set sail, but though they left, the damage had already been done. The Black Death was now in Europe, and millions would die in what is considered one of the greatest disasters in history. Let's explore how the bubonic plague wiped out at least a third of Europe's population if not more in this episode of the Infographic Show. What made the Black Death so deadly? Europe was hit hard by the plague, but it was not hit first. It was also not unaware of a disease that was already bringing widespread death and destruction elsewhere. Before the infested ships arrived in Sicily, rumors of a frightful sickness devastating the populations of first China and then India, Egypt, Persia, and Syria had spread near and far. While no one knew what caused it or why, it seemed to follow trade routes spanning the near and far east. Further, when it appeared, it was by all accounts unstoppable. Those struck by the Black Death would begin to swell at the lymph nodes located in their groin area or underarm regions. The growths would soon develop into large blackish-blue egg-sized lumps, or for the even less fortunate, expand to the size of apples. These would then fester and ooze various bodily fluids. Beyond this, those with the disease could develop any combination of a series of additional symptoms. These included fever, pain, chills, sweating, upset stomach, and diarrhea. Almost all Always, this was followed by death. According to those who observed its effects firsthand, all it appeared to take was a brief physical contact with the clothing of someone who was sick to pass the disease onto another. Though some doctors claimed that it was the spirit leaving the body of the deceased that infected others as it passed by. Obviously, at this point in history, the real methods of disease transmission were not yet well understood. Without understanding it, most were helpless to defend against it. Few areas other than some islands cut off from the rest of Europe by the sea made it through the pandemic plague-free. The rest of the population was not so lucky. The bacterium infiltrated virtually every European city's defenses, and many who appeared perfectly healthy one day could be dead a few days later. It was uncommon, though possible, for someone to survive a week or two before he or she died. Compounding problems further, those with the disease would typically be asymptomatic for the first few days, and so no one would be aware that they had caught it. This meant that successfully isolating them from the rest of society at this point was all but impossible. Those who tried the next best thing to protect themselves by fleeing for the country were not safe there either. The plague decimated livestock as well, and countless pigs, cows, chickens, goats, and sheep who also died a brutal death. This was such a problem that it led to a shortage of wool throughout the continent. While many European areas had a death figure of around 30%, 90% of the Italian city of Florence perished. Sometimes bodies of the deceased remained where they had died, as there were not enough people still living to bury them. Thousands of French villages in addition to areas in other locations were left without a single remaining soul. The Black Death had mercilessly transformed them into ghost towns. In some instances, nature eventually took over and areas that people once called home were reclaimed by surrounding forest. It took aerial photography following the end of World War I to rediscover these locations as places where men, women, and children once lived. Most estimates place Europe's death toll between 50 and 70 million, or around 30-some percent, though the CDC claims it killed as much as 60% of the population, which is considerably more. Worldwide estimates typically range from 155 to 200 million. The world at the time was a mere 500 million people, so nearly half of all its inhabitants, or again according to some sources even more, were killed. So how was it that the Black Death was able to spread so quickly and wipe out so many, people and animals alike? Well, for one, as previously mentioned, there was little in the way of scientific knowledge in the 1300s. Not only did people not understand the plague's causes or modes of transmission, but there were also countless failures in how those in the medical field attempted to treat it. It is true that Yersinia pestis, the bacterium behind the Black Death, or bubonic plague, is highly contagious. It can also be spread in many ways, though obviously contaminated spirits aren't one of them. Many believe that in its later stages it had the ability to morph into an airborne strain. That could be passed on to a new host via a simple sneeze or cough. However, all strains airborne or those in the more initial stages that are not are believed to have been transferred through a flea or lice bite, and many animals in addition to country 
countryside livestock serve as hosts for the bacterium and blood-sucking pests. Examples are things like squirrels, rabbits, chipmunks, and mice. However, many in the scientific field have argued that by far the worst contributor to the spread of the Black Death was the urban rat and its flea. Part of the reason for this belief is that rats have been observed to develop symptoms quite similar to those in people, and in cases of the modern-day plague, many people with the sickness had accompanying bites from fleas. Recent outbreaks often follow what's known as rat falls as well, or where rodents die off in record amounts for whatever reason. Thus, the most prevalent theory is that the Black Death all began when rats with the plague died and their fleas then looked for more blood in another readily available source, which would at times be human. Upon being bitten by the contaminated flea, this person would then be exposed to the deadly bacteria. Seemingly in support of this theory, ships during the mid-1300s were commonly infested with the furry rodents who thrived in their dark, moist environment. And following the death ship's arrival in Sicily, the plague continued to spread further, following a trade route pattern, as it had previously in Asia, to other port locations throughout Europe and as far down as North Africa. However, more recently there have been some proposed tweaks to this rat-based theory. As we just mentioned, the Black Death, after all, is not the only outbreak of the plague in the world's history. There have been outbreaks before as well as after, and those that took place more recently followed a different pattern entirely. Europe's Black Death spread much faster, and as far as historical records are concerned, there was no mention of a mass rat die-off in the days or months preceding it. Now, some scientists suggest that it was human fleas and lice that were the true culprits behind Europe's version of the disease. In this case, fleas would bite infected people and then move on to others one by one who happen to be in their nearby vicinity. They describe the underlying mathematical model that a rat flea spread follows is quite different from a human flea or lice one, and when information is plugged into simulations, the human flea model more closely matched data from seven of nine plague-hit European cities. Those with this newest evidence admit that the causes of the plague are surrounded by ongoing controversy. However, whether the fleas were of human or rat variety, it's a blood-sucking pest of one kind or another that likely passed it on successfully and so very quickly. It also turns out that the Black Death may not have been causing mass devastation all by itself. When victims' bodies were exhumed from mass graves in England, anthrax spores were also discovered along with them. If anthrax was occurring at the same time as the plague, this would definitely have made things much worse. Anthrax can not only be passed by coming into contact with sweat, saliva, or tears, but also by mere skin contact. In other words, at the time of the Black Death pandemic, people could have come down with a life-threatening disease of one kind or another in pretty much every conceivable way. It's possible anthrax and other diseases made people extra susceptible to the plague due to already compromised immunity. Also, it's possible that the body count of those claimed by the Black Death included victims that actually died from anthrax or other diseases. Beyond its quick transfer from host to host and the contributions of additional disease, the way the Black Death was treated failed to help and may have actually helped kill victims or spread it further on intentionally. For example, at least initially, medical practitioners would do things such as perform bloodletting on patients with the plague. This is where they cut into the veins or arteries in the neck or arms of those who were sick so that their blood flowed freely. This procedure was nothing new, and in fact dated back as far as to the times of ancient Egypt and Greece. Historical figures believed that to be healthy the body needed the right balance of blood, phlegm, and bile. Bloodletting was believed to correct a possible imbalance of too much blood Blood, which is what caused the person to get sick. Unfortunately, the procedure appeared to be as ineffective for the victims of the plague as it was for Charles II or George Washington centuries later. While Washington awoke with a sore throat and King Charles suffered a seizure, following bloodletting treatment, both died shortly thereafter. Boil lancing was another technique used as a form of treatment, which was just how it sounds. Someone would essentially lance or stick a pointy object into the boils to drain them of their gooey contents. If this wasn't done, they would only continue to grow larger and, in time, poison their host due to the mass buildup of dead blood and pus. Then again, popping them could also cause death due to toxic shock. Beyond the patient likely dying, the boils contained highly contagious matter and possibly spread the disease yet further. 
Other methods such as burning of various herbs or immersing the sick in vinegar or rose water were also, unsurprisingly, ineffective. In time, after failure upon failure and in an attempt at self-preservation, many doctors simply stopped accepting patients. Even priests began refusing to perform last rites out of danger for their own safety. Where men failed, nature did little to help either. Not only did people have little idea of how to handle the plague, but they were genetically prone to succumbing to it. Studies of the remains of the European population at the time determined that only 0.2% had a gene that offered them any form of immunity. The other 99.8% had none. Since so many of those who were susceptible to the plague died from it, they did not pass their genes on further to the following generations. Many of those who did have the gene lived on to procreate. This is why Caucasian Americans now have a 15% chance of having some resistance to the disease. This is pretty good news, considering the modern form of the plague is still around today. One encounter via the 12 so-called death ships would go on to wipe out men, women, and children to such an extent that it would change the tide of history. You've been feeling pretty lonely lately, so you decide that it's time to get yourself a pet. But you don't want to be too mainstream about it, so instead of a nice dog or a cat, you opt for a rat. Hey, rats can be cute too, you know. You and your rat, Wilbur, quickly become best of friends, but then one day your best rat buddy picks up an unwanted hitchhiker, a flea. Then Wilbur's flea decides that it'd like to take a chomp out of you, and without you even feeling it, the tiny flea has bitten you and sucked on your blood. For the next three days, you and Wilbur continue your best friendship, going on best friend adventures and solving mysteries together, and then on the fourth day, you start to not feel so hot. You chalk it up to all the excitement you and Wilbur have been sharing lately. But as the symptoms progress, you start to feel like you might have the flu instead. Then suddenly, you start growing what look like huge blisters in your armpits and groin, and the tips of your fingers turn black as the flesh begins to die. Congratulations, because you've got the bubonic plague, and much like most of Europe back in the 1300s, you're about to be dead. The plague, or Black Death as it was most commonly known, has its origins amongst the fleas of rodents from the central and western Asian region of the world. It's believed that climate change during a period of warming during the medieval ages caused the rodents who carried the infected fleas to flee the drying up grasslands, while those rodents who didn't believe in climate change stayed behind and died. Forced into close contact with humanity, the fleas of these rodents began to feast on our soft, supple human flesh and in return infected us with the plague. Historians believe that the plague killed off many early populations of humans before naturally receding, but what would come to be known as the Black Death kicked off in earnest early in the 1300s. A succession of natural disasters and lesser plagues hit South and Central Asia, which led to widespread famine. Not wanting to be left out of the Kill All Humans party, the bubonic plague arrived in 1331 and is believed to have killed 25 million Chinese people before it finally reached Constantinople in 1347. Mongol raids and travelers along the famous Silk Road are believed to have pushed the disease further and further west, but it wasn't until Genoese traders brought the plague-infected fleas into the port city of Kaffa in Crimea in 1347 that the bubonic plague went mainstream. Pretty soon, the Black Death, as it was known by then, was all the rage amongst Europeans, and by 1351 it had reached as far west as Spain and as far north as Russia. Before the Black Death went out of style, it had killed between 75 to 200 million people, and it's believed that it took the world 200 years to recover the numbers lost to the disease. In the wake of the plague, zealous persecution of various scapegoats blamed for the outbreak led to the death of many thousands more including Jews, friars, foreigners, beggars, pilgrims, lepers, gypsies, and people who get to the front of the line at Starbucks and have to check the menu because they still aren't sure what to order. The plague had such a good time in Europe, though, that it revisited the continent intermittently throughout the 14th and 17th centuries, causing many hundreds of thousands of additional deaths. In 1771, the plague hit Moscow and killed between 50,000 and 100,000 people, or as much as 33% of the city's population. A hundred years before that, the plague killed 100,000 in London. Like adventurous European university students, though, the plague went global, and between 1500 and 1850, the plague was present in at least one location throughout the entire Islamic world. So you've just gone and gotten yourself infected with the Black Death, because maybe modern diseases are just too trendy for you. Why is this the worst thing that could ever happen to you? Well, first, could it happen to you? The answer to that question is no. Humanity has long since overcome the terrible affliction known as the Black Death, 
and is safe from the ravages that once killed hundreds of millions of people. Just kidding, you can totally get the Black Death today. And if you think you're safe in your first world life because surely it's only a disease that strikes at the most remote, poorest regions of the world, you may want to think again. As of 1900, the Black Death has made its way to the United States, when an epidemic struck San Francisco and lasted until 1904, then quickly made a comeback throughout 1907 and 1908. While that was over a hundred years ago and we have developed many drugs and treatments for the plague, just in October of 2017, the deadliest outbreak in modern times hit Madagascar and killed 170 people while infecting thousands more. But that's an island off the coast of Africa, and San Francisco was over a hundred years in the past. Surely we're safe today. Once more, no, absolutely not. And in fact, the western United States is one of the largest geographic areas where the plague is reported in wild animals and livestock alike. So keep that in mind next time you decide to hit up a petting zoo. But what about the plague is so terrible? Well, before we tell you, we'll warn you to go ahead and finish eating if you were eating, or to cancel any lunch or dinner plans you may have had coming up. Because we doubt you'll have the appetite after this episode. It starts off with a flea bite, or perhaps a bite from an infected rodent and then suddenly your body is host to a nasty little bacteria called Yersinia pestis. Our bodies, however, have had plenty of exposure to the plague by now, seeing as Yersinia pestis' favorite historical pastime was to murder all humans, and so the body has learned to very quickly recognize Y. pestis from a unique molecule in its outer membrane. Unfortunately, sometime in the past, Yersinia pestis caught on to this fact, and now when it detects a temperature of about 98.6 degrees, the bacteria figures that it's inside a warm-blooded mammal. This triggers Y. pestis to modify the structure of the giveaway molecule, effectively blinding your body's immune system to its real identity. With your immune system fooled, Y. pestis makes a mad dash for your lymph nodes, which seems like an odd choice for an invading bacteria because your body's lymph nodes are basically immune system fortresses and constantly looking for foreign invaders to wipe out. For any other bacteria, this would pretty much be a suicide run, but Y. pestis is basically the SEAL Team 6 of bacteria. Your body immediately tries to stop the bacteria with white blood cells, the cells responsible for immune system response. But Y. pestis responds by shooting these responding cells with an appendage that injects toxins directly inside the cell's membranes, destroying it. After owning the crap out of your immune system, Y. pestis needs to recover by getting a hold of some iron, and luckily for it, your body is chock full of it. Unfortunately for the bacteria, all that precious iron in your body is wrapped up in hemoglobin and other proteins. Or unfortunate for you, really, because if you've learned anything by now, it's that Y. pestis gets what it wants when it wants it. While it holds the fork down in your lymph node, each bacteria releases a molecule called Yersinia bactin, which is a very high affinity for iron. The molecules cruise through your blood system on the lookout for a specific iron-rich protein in your body called transferrin. Once the molecules find some transferrin, they literally rip the iron away from the protein, destroying it in the process and bringing it back home to Y. pestis. By now, the plague is happily making your lymph nodes into its new home, kicking up its feet and replicating out of control thanks to a rich supply of iron. At this point, you're definitely feeling under the weather, with general flu-like symptoms, but if you're like most people, you ignore these symptoms and push through without going to a doctor. In this case, your failure to get checked out will be fatal. As with modern medicine, the plague can be cured in over 90% of cases if caught early. If not, well, your odds aren't very good at all. At this point, your lymph nodes will begin swelling up, which create the iconic buboes so characteristic of the bubonic plague. These look like very large blisters and can appear on the arms, leg, groin, and armpits, can grow to be as big as an apple. By now, you're going to have a really high fever and might even be vomiting blood. And if any of those buboes burst open, you'll be oozing pus and other disgusting fluids from the open source. This can be extremely dangerous because buboes that are burst open can lead to secondary infections from other bacteria. But luckily for you, you'll be dead long before any of those infections can properly set in. Gangrene can also set into extremities and fingers and toes can blacken as the flesh dies and eventually falls off. Incredibly, it's not the plague that kills you though, but rather your own body that does the deed. With Y. pestis bacteria throughout your bloodstream, your immune system totally loses its cool and triggers a condition known as septic shock, causing your blood vessels to leak, which lowers blood volume, clotting, and eventually organ failure. Luckily, though, modern medicine is able to cure a plague if caught quickly enough, 
Though many doctors today worry that the plague will very quickly begin to develop an immunity to most of the drugs we use against it. This has prompted a renewal of the arms race that has lasted for millennia between man and bacteria, and it's hoped that new vaccines and antibodies can be developed to stop the plague before it kicks off another world tour and leaves millions dead in its wake. Where in the past, the remote nature of most human villages and cities made it difficult for the plague to be transmitted and thus limited its lethality, today's hyper-connected world would let the plague travel around the world in as little as a day, and an outbreak that started far overseas could be in your neighborhood by that evening. In fact, it might already be there and we might all be on the verge of the next huge outbreak. This year in many countries throughout the world, the flu has been deadly. The CDC reported that in America it has been unusually active, and in January it was revealed that the virus was killing around 100 people every week in the US. In the UK they've had the worst flu season in many years, but it's also been a global concern with countries all over Asia and Africa experiencing what many are calling one of the worst global flu outbreaks in a long time. So much so that scientists said it's imperative to create a much more effective universal influenza vaccine. We might regard ourselves as fortunate though, based on what you're about to hear. In this episode of the Infographic Show, could the Black Death happen again? Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of our notification squad. First of all, what is or what was the Black Death, also known as the Plague? Well, it was one of the worst pandemics in history, killing somewhere between 75 to 200 million people in Europe and Eurasia in just a few years from 1346 to 1353. After it was done, something like 30 to 60 percent of Europe's population had been wiped out, with many others dying in other parts of the world as well. In fact, it killed so many people, it took centuries for the world's population to stabilize. It also made comebacks in Europe later on, such as the Great Plague of London from 1665 to 1666, but the 14th century Black Death was the worst pandemic the world has ever seen in terms of loss of life. It's thought it made its way to Europe on Genoese trading ships. The ships arrived at the Sicilian port of Messina, only for those who came to greet them to be faced with a nasty surprise. Most of the occupants of the ships were either dead or dying. It's thought the ships had been to parts of Central Asia, and there it said rats carrying the bacterium Yersinia pestis came aboard the ships. Fleas on these rodents were the vectors that passed the disease to humans. Authorities in Sicily soon ordered all the death ships out of the harbor, but it was too late, and soon people all over Europe were getting infected. It spread so easily because it was airborne, which meant coughing or sneezing was enough to spread the disease around. So what's it like to get down with a dose of Black Death? During the pandemic, an Italian poet called Giovanni Boccaccio described it like this. At the beginning of the malady, certain swellings, either on the groin or under the armpits, waxed to the bigness of a common apple, others to the size of an egg, some more and some less, and these the vulgar named plague boils. These eggs that he describes are called buboes. Once they appeared, soon after the victim would have a very high fever, usually start coughing up blood because of lung infection, and between two and seven days, it was often game over. If you got it, you most likely died. But not everyone did, and true to Nietzschean philosophy, what didn't kill them made them stronger. Studies have found that those who survived became healthier. It's believed the plague had a mortality rate of 30 to 75 percent. It was a time of chaos as whole communities lived in fear. Doctors didn't want to treat the infected for fear of being infected themselves, while mobs were busy ascribing the blame to any minority such as lepers, Jews, foreigners, or even people with acne. Entire Jewish communities were destroyed and thousands of Jewish people were murdered. You get the picture, this was a grim time to be European. As we said, it came back many times, but never as virulent as those years in the 1300s. What might surprise you though, is that the bubonic plague is still making appearances around the globe. It killed 10 million in China in the 19th century, more than 1,000 in Australia in the early 20th century, and over 100 in San Francisco also in the early 19th century. It's thought that in 2017, around 202 people died in Madagascar from the pneumonic plague, according to the WHO. This was from 2,348 confirmed, probable, and suspected cases. Fewer people died, of course, because of modern medicine and healthcare. By the way, there are three kinds of plague, bubonic, pneumonic, and septicemic. The difference is in how it infects you, with bubonic getting your lymph nodes, hence the ugly eggs, pneumonic gets the lungs, and septicemic is an infection in the blood. You can be treated for a mnemonic plague with antibiotics, but left untreated you will surely die. Most modern cases have been in developing nations, but there have also been some cases in the USA. In fact, in 2015, 16, and 17, a handful of bubonic plague cases occurred in the country. The CDC reports that more than 80% of United States plague cases have been the bubonic form, 
It stated that from 2000 to 2016, around 7 cases of plague occurred in the country every year, and most of those were in the rural west, and some in northern New Mexico and northern Arizona. The worst year this century for the US was 2015, when 15 people were infected and 4 of them died. Also, according to the CDC, the Europeans are now in good shape, with the department stating that all continents report instances of plague except Europe, Australia, and Antarctica. The advice given by health professionals if you want to stay plague free is don't get bitten by fleas and don't mess with rats or other animals that could carry fleas. Easier said than done. In 2014, a man from Oregon was infected with plague after his infected cat bit him. News media reports that he had lumps under his arms the size of lemons, his hands and feet turned black due to gangrene, and he was in a coma on life support for a month. He told The Guardian, I had collapsed lungs, my heart stopped, and my hands and feet turned black. Technically, I shouldn't be here. He was so violently sick because he had all three kinds of plague. His cat didn't fare well, and it ended up being buried in the garden before the man got really sick. The man lives a full life again, minus most of his fingers and toes. So now we come to the essential question. Could there be another massive plague outbreak? The answer is that it is very unlikely because we can treat it before it spreads. Most of us these days don't live in rat-infested squalor, as many Londoners did back in those bleak times. When the Smithsonian asked the scientist this question, he, like most others, said an outbreak was unlikely. What was possible, though, was a plague-based bioterror weapon that spreads the disease. Yes, our wonderful species has in the past created plague bioweapons, with some of the guilty countries being Japan, the former Soviet Union, and the United States of America. Despite being one of the most exciting and rich periods in history, the Middle Ages were a tough time to live in. Among other horrible things, that time period experienced a plague that wiped out 75 million folks across Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, high infant mortality, famine, and battles. Add to that a social infrastructure that was frankly shocking, and zero social welfare. But just how dangerous was it to live in the Middle Ages, and what would your chances be of actually surviving the period? That's what we'll find out today. In this episode of the Infographic Show, Most Common Ways People Died in the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages, or Medieval Period, lasted from the 5th to the 15th century. It began with the fall of the Roman Empire and led into the Renaissance and Age of Discovery. This period predates the discovery of penicillin and germ theory, meaning that death by disease was a common occurrence among medieval people. Poor health conditions and malnutrition added to the problem. Diseases and conditions common to the period were dysentery, gonorrhea, influenza, leprosy, malaria, measles, smallpox, typhoid, and puerperal fever. In the Prussian town of Elbing in August 1349, the Black Death was first recorded, and this terrible illness has long been associated with death in the Middle Ages. Studies have shown that people around this period had a life expectancy somewhere in the 30 to 40s. That piece of data is, according to some sources, misleading, as the life expectancy rate was dragged down significantly by the high infant mortality rate caused by death at childbirth and disease in infancy. Many people did in fact live to 60 or 70 years of age or older during the Middle Ages. Enrico Dandolo became the Doge of Venice at the age of 85 and died old and blind at 98 in the year 1205. However, death by childbirth was a serious problem as hygiene was yet to be fully understood. Both the rich and poor died in childbirth, queens often died while giving birth to future princes and princesses, thus greatly affecting lines of inheritance and courses of history. Richer families could usually afford to hire a wet nurse if the mother died during childbirth, but peasant families were forced to be more inventive by soaking bread in milk for the infant to ingest, or even soaking a rag in milk and letting the child suckle from the rag. Death arrived to children in the shape of germs and viruses that people in the Middle Ages had no idea led to disease, having had no knowledge of germ theory. There were no antibiotics or vaccines to protect the most vulnerable members of society, the very old and the very young. The death rate for children was horrendously high, and to survive birth and infancy put one in good stead for the pursuant obstacles this tough period in history brought. Poor medical care, weak immune systems, infectious diseases, and hunger killed countless of people during the Middle Ages, but perhaps no event was as undeniably devastating as the Black Death. One third of the population of Europe between 1347 and 1352 were wiped out by bubonic and pneumonic plagues that ravaged the region. 
This outbreak was probably the most deadly force, the most tragic pandemic event to have swept through a populated region, killing at least 75 million people throughout Europe, Northern Africa, and the Middle East. If we factor in that the population of Europe was thought to be around 70 million in 1350, then yes, the plague was responsible for a huge number of deaths. And if we were living at that time in Europe, many of us would have become part of the estimated 50% of Europe's population who fell victim to it. And then there were those who died on the battlefield. Hacked and cut with weapons, and with no means to properly clean infected wounds, soldiers often led short, brutal lives. However, casualties and medieval battles were often surprisingly light. Once one side had lost 5-10% to of their number, noblemen and officers were often held to ransom. Many army casualties were slayed by disease, foodborne poisoning, and septicemia instead. Amputations were not to be taken lightly, and many died from contamination and dirty surgical instruments. An aesthetic was unheard of, and if drinking enough alcohol wouldn't stop the screams, you may have been knocked with a blow to the head instead. Those higher ranking officers, who were able to access the cutting edge medical science at the time, enjoyed leeches applied to wounds, or perhaps a course of bloodletting. Traveling was no picnic either. Finding a safe place to stop while traveling was troublesome, and folks often had to resort to sleeping out in the open, running a risk of freezing to death in the winter, or being robbed or killed on the road. Food was also hard to come by on the road, and the traveler was often forced to forage, steal, or go without. Lack of foreign languages could be problematic, and travelers may find themselves caught up in local disputes or battles, and things weren't much better at sea. While it was faster to travel by sea, boarding a vessel put the traveler at risk of sudden storms or shoddy navigation. The ships themselves weren't particularly safe until later in the Middle Ages, but on land or at sea, life certainly wasn't a breeze during this fascinating period of history. What were some of the other brutal periods of history to live through? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Also, be sure to watch our other video called What Would Happen If You Ate Only Meat and Nothing Else? Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time!